let your favorite wall fall. I used to have a favorite wall. It was the wall behind the house of my grandma. Behind that wall was the hospital. I was born in that hospital, so in reality, I was born behind that wall. <laughs> now, because we had a sh the chance to spend some time at the house of my grandma, especially during vacations, we transformed that wall, a big, thick brick wall, into a playground. Because of erosion, some of the bricks were wearing away. So if you rub the brick really hard with something hard, you could obtain a powder that looked like a red pepper. And you could even prepare a dish out of that powder. You just couldn't eat it. <laughs> so as a result of our uh, procedures, of food preparation, little by little, we created holes in the wall. That's how we turned the wall into a climbing wall. Because now you had holes that you could place your feet in, and there you could climb and sit on top of the wall, riding it like this. Now, the wall was separating two worlds my world, our world, and their world. Sitting on that wall, you could almost always see some children playing on the other side. Those were children hospitalized in the children section of the hospital that was behind the wall. And uh, I have to admit, we not always treated them nicely. Sometimes we showed them things or yelled things at them. Thinking back now, I feel like we did things to them that are just little short of bullying, if not tantamount to bullying. And I know that was bad, but you know, when you're a child and you're riding your wall and uh, you believe you belong to the better side of the wall, you have to show off. I know it's childish. This attitude changed one day when my little brother, the one next to me, because we are four, one older and two younger than me, the one next to me got sick, and he got hospitalized. Mom could not be with him in the hospital. The hospital would not allow her to be with my little brother. But she somehow convinced them to allow me to be with him there in the hospital. So now, here I am on the other side of the wall. And my elder brother, Alex, is riding the wall. He climbed up to the top of it from the other side. And I want to ride the wall as well. I want to see what's going on on the better side of the wall. But I can't because on this side, the wall doesn't have holes. So there's no way for me to climb and ride the wall. I feel trapped. I have the impression something is wrong because now I belong to the wrong side of the wall, and I want to go back to the other side. After a few days, my little brother gets discharged so I can go back to my better side of the world. And uh, that incident got me thinking, really. Because I was thinking about how stupid it can be for somebody to believe 
that he or she would always belong to the better side of the wall. How stupid it can be to be riding that wall and have the impression you are somebody and those on the other side of the wall are nobody. How stupid it can be to have the pride and treat everybody with prejudice just because you believe you belong to the better side of the wall and you're able to ride your wall. Do you have a favorite wall? Let us pray. Lord, your word is going to stir us today. May Jesus Christ be lifted up. May the Holy Spirit do some demolition. And may we all grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may remember last time we finished with some very well-known verses from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You may still remember the broom, the broom cannot create itself. The broom needs a creator in order to be created. Similarly, you cannot be created by yourself. You need a creator to create yourself. The difference between you and the broom is that this broom cannot have anything against the Creator's will of creating it. You have willpower. You can make a decision whether you will allow the Creator to create you or not. But then the Apostle Paul continues speaking about something he wants to remind us of. He wants us to remember something. He says, therefore, remember. His original audience there are Gentiles converted to Christianity. Because roughly speaking, in those days, there are two categories of Christians. One is Jews converted to Christianity and Gentiles converted to Christianity. It seems that the letter to the Ephesians was primarily written to Gentiles converted to Christianity. He says, therefore, remember, remember, because you may have forgotten. Remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, and that is a pejorative word that hides prejudice, you who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, and that word hides pride. You know, pride and prejudice go hand in hand. Made in the flesh by hands. So we have uncircumcision on the other side. We have circumcision on this side. Remember, says Paul, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth or citizenship of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God 
in the world. He gives them five so they can count them on their five fingers. And then he goes on, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, far off, far off, have been brought near, have been brought near, brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14. For He Himself, who? Christ Himself, is our peace. Shalom. He's our shalom. He's our Irene or Irene as the name coming from the Greek word for shalom. He is our shalom who has made both one, both one, and has broken down the middle wall. There has been a middle wall of separation or a partition wall of separation. And the word there for separation is phragma in the Greek. You have the word in English, diaphragm. You know what that is? A diaphragm is a fence, because that's phragma, fence. It's a fence between the abdominal cavity and the thoracical cavity. A fence, a separation, something in between. A phragma. The picture is very interesting. Because remember, in those days when Paul is writing, there is still a temple in Jerusalem. The temple is not demolished yet. Somewhat later, in uh, 70 AD, the temple will be destroyed. But that temple had a fence of separation between two different courts. One was the court of the Israelites, the Jews, and the other was the court of the Gentiles. In between, a fence was built, a fence that was not there at the tabernacle, the original sanctuary. It wasn't there at the Temple of Solomon. But sometime later, in the time of Herod the Great, they built a fence between the Jews and the Gentiles. And if a Gentile wanted to pass the fence, he could pay with his life. So when Paul uses this fence language, there are some historical backgrounds to it that put those that are uncircumcised on one side and those that are circumcised on the other side. And the word used by Paul for uncircumcised is a pejorative word. It's like calling them names. It's like those that are circumcision are sitting on the wall, they themselves build, and looking with pride and prejudice to those others, calling them names. Those are the uncircumcised, uncircumcision. And Paul says, he, Jesus Christ, broke down that wall of separation, that fence. But is that more than just a fence in Jerusalem? Because in Jerusalem, the fence was still there. And this letter is written to those in Ephesus, way apart. So he says, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments in ordinances. So you have a wall of separation, a fence that is demolished. How? By the fact that he abolishes the enmity. What is the enmity? 
It's the law of commandments in ordinances. And the word translated there with ordinance is dogma in the Greek. And dogma means many things. Opinion, judgment, belief, principle, tenet, doctrine, requirement, decree. You know, in, in uh, historical Christianity, there is something called church dogma. What is that? Uh, something they have decided, and there's no way to go back and change that. That's a dogma. In philosophy, they use concepts like the dogma of Plato or Socrates. Something they established, something firm they established. We also use in our current English, dogmatic, as in, why are you so dogmatic on this? What is that? When somebody's dogmatic on something, that's a fixed, a settled opinion, an idea that would not change, something that is so deeply ingrained that somebody would say, no, 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 I'm not going to let this go. So that's the word used by the Apostle Paul. But what is the law of commandments in ordinances? You know, in Christianity to these days, there are people, Christians, that say the law of commandments in ordinances that was abolished by Jesus Christ in His flesh is the Ten Commandments. Well, the Ten Commandments are never called in the Bible as dogma. Actually, whenever dogma appears in the New Testament and also in the Septuagint Greek of the Old Testament, it's more about decrees given by humans. In the book of Daniel, it appears several times. The kings that give decrees, they give dogmas. The Ten Commandments of God are not something that create enmity. On the contrary, the Ten Commandments are about right treatment, how to approach somebody the right way so that you prevent enmity. The Ten Commandments are not about creating fences or walls of separation. No, it's about having the right attitude and uh, treating people the right way so those fences will never appear. And interestingly, there's one more verse in the writing of the, of the Apostle Paul where the two words, law and abolish, law and abolish, appear together. It's Romans chapter 3. This is what he says. Do we then make void? It's the same Greek word, katargo. Do we abolish the law, the law, through faith? Certainly not, he says. On the contrary, we establish the law. So then, how are we supposed to establish the law through faith if God demolishes or abolishes the law, if this is about the Ten Commandments indeed? Well, it cannot be. Then some people will say it's the ceremonial law. And with that, there are some challenges as well. Because first of all, the Bible never uses that concept, ceremonial law. If you read through the Bible, you will never come across a verse or a section that says, okay, now the ceremonial law starts and here it is where it ends. Ceremonial law is indeed a theological concept or some church jargon by which different people understand different things. If you do a research, you will be amazed of how many different definitions people have for that concept of ceremonial law. My main issue is that in many situations, 
the ceremonial law has become like a basket labeled CL, ceremonial law, and whatever we find in the Bible that we don't like or that we don't understand, we take that thing, throw it in that basket and give it to Jesus to abolish it. And that's a reality. Let's be honest and admit that not everything that we think may be ceremonial law is ceremonial law that is abolished. And in the Bible, there are ceremonies, there are rituals. Let me just mention a few. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, laying hands, anointing people. Are those ceremonies done away with? No. Well, there is a special set of rules and regulations that had to do with the way the sacrifices were brought at the temple, specifically how and when and what kind of sacrifice is being brought. And since Jesus Christ died, from that point on, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, those things are unpracticable, practically, because if you don't have the sacrifice, how are you going to follow the procedures, the rituals, the ceremonies to do the sacrifice, right? But then my question is, those ceremonial rules and regulations, were they abolished, really? Let me read something from Matthew chapter 5. Do not think, says Jesus, that I came to destroy or abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So, are they abolished or rather fulfilled? It's fulfilled. Jesus never says, hey, now I'm canceling this out. No, no. He fulfills those things because he was brought as a sacrifice once for all. And watch this. When Jesus says, do not think I came to destroy or abolish the law or the prophets, he's not speaking here about the Ten Commandments only because the law and the prophets is the biblical way of saying the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament. And the entire Old Testament was not to be used as a wall of separation, as a fence. On the contrary, if you read through the Old Testament, you will see that God gives specific prescriptions how to treat the outsiders, the newcomers, the foreigners, the strangers, in a nice and welcoming manner. So we cannot see that the Old Testament in any way is meant to be a wall of separation or a fence between the Jews and the Gentiles. So what is this law of commandments in ordinances or of the fence about? Well, let me read some verses from Jesus himself. Matthew 15. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God, he says, because of your tradition? Please see the contrast. Commandment of God and tradition. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Verses 7 and 9. Hypocrites, he says, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines or dogmas, the commandments of men. And then the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10, this is what he says, you know how unlawful is for a Jew if it's unlawful 
then there must be a law that makes it unlawful, right? How unlawful is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation? How unlawful is for somebody here on this side of the wall to go to this side of the wall? It's unlawful, Peter says. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. What kind of law is he speaking about? Well, the same thing that Jesus called commandments of men. Things that in those days, in Jesus' days, were oral traditions, oral laws. And later on, they were written down in what they call the Talmud. And the Talmud has two sections, the Mishnah and the Gemara. And in those writings, there are specific things, prescriptions about the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. It is a virtue to separate from the Gentiles. And this kind of attitude creates a culture of hostility, of animosity, of enmity between Jews and Gentiles. And I would like to quote the Mishnah. Look what it says. Mishnah, chapters of the Fathers 3. Rabbi Akiva said, Tradition is a fence to the Torah. And then he speaks about some other fences as well. So you have the Torah, God's law, and tradition is a fence around the Torah to protect the Torah. The problem was that in Paul's times, there were Gentiles that came to Christianity, and there were Jews that came to Christianity, and the Gentiles really wanted to obey the Torah, but the Jews wanted to, to enforce on them or make them also accept the fence of the Torah. Yes, the Torah is God's law, but the fence is human tradition. And because of this dispute between the Torah and tradition, there were all kind of weird situations. I'm going to just show one that the Apostle Paul reports happening somewhere, Galatians chapter 2. Now when Peter, he says, Peter, so the same Peter that said, you know how unlawful it is. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood or opposed to him to his face, says Paul, because he was to be blamed. He was in the wrong. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. He would take the liberty to come over here and eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separate. He put the fence back. He separated himself from the Gentiles, fearing those who were, on, uh, were of the circumcision. Remember the language of Paul? Circumcision and uncircumcision, because these of the circumcision, they knew how to ride that wall of separation and make fun or judge or criticize those that were from the uncircumcised side of the church. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, this is what Paul says, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage or a yoke of slavery. Leave the fence. Let the fence be removed. Allow Jesus Christ to break down the wall of separation because that's not from God. 
And why, to what end, does Jesus do the demolishing? Why does he remove the fence? Well, we are going on, verse 15, so as to create again. Because he wants to create. To create in himself one new man from the two. Meaning, take this one and take this one from the one, create one new. That's making peace, making shalom. But actually, the shalom is made in a specific way, verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, the hostility. In other words, both the Jews and the Gentiles have to be reconciled to God because that's how he can create the shalom between them. And what Jesus does is amazing because he destroys the wall of separation. And he came and preached peace, says Paul, to you who were afar off and to those who were near because both needed peace. Both needed shalom in Jesus Christ, reconciling them to the Father not that the father had a problem against them, but they ran away from the father. So they are brought back to the father now. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the father. That's how we are all adopted children or re-adopted children of the father. Now, all this is a beautiful history lesson. question is, how does that help us. Let me ask, do you have a favorite wall? Do you have a wall of separation, a fence, a favorite wall? Well, let your wall, your favorite wall, fall. Let me ask you some questions. You don't have to answer you just process it. It will be a little hard to take, so please uh, find your comfortable position. In this church, because I believe this is the body of Jesus Christ, the small-scale representation of the world church of Jesus Christ, in this church are there walls of separation, fences, meaning Walls, fences, created by our traditions, not by the Torah, by our traditions. Because I rarely, if ever, have seen somebody being dogmatic on the Torah. But when it comes to our own ideas, opinions, dogmas, oh my Lord, we can be so dogmatic. So let me start. Is there a wall of separation, a fence of separation between between Traditionals and progressives. Let me use the newer language. Conservatives and liberals. Have you noticed that most of the time those designations have nothing to do with the Torah, with God's Word? Those are determined based on political doctrine or our attitude toward church tradition. Second question. Is there a wall of separation in this church, my beloved church family, between those that were born in the U.S. culture 
and those that were born outside of the U.S. culture. Every culture has good things and bad things. Am I mature enough to acknowledge that my culture as well needs Jesus Christ? And I put on this for a cultural touch. <laughs> Something special to show that I'm here to appreciate the otherness, the difference of an other culture. When it comes to tradition, if it doesn't contradict the Torah, I will not allow tradition to become a fence around the Torah, a fence of separation between my culture and their culture or our culture and their culture. Number three, is there a wall of separation in this church between those that were born in a Seventh-day Adventist family and those that were not born in a Seventh-day Adventist family? If you are like me, born in a Seventh-day Adventist family, we come, we bring with us some prefabricated products, Seventh-day Adventist products. Some of them are from the Bible. Some of them are from tradition. Now, there is nothing wrong with our tradition because they can be good traditions and yet not biblical traditions. If that tradition only gives me a different flavor, all right. But if I use my tradition to build a fence between my Seventh-day Adventist heritage and your Seventh-day Adventist heritage, then let my wall, my favorite wall, fall. Four, is there a wall of separation in this church, in my beloved church, between those that like the way one pastor does things and those that like the way some other pastor does things? See, pastors, your pastors, past, present, and future, are human beings used by God to shepherd. They have strengths and weaknesses. They have habits that you may like or not. They may even create a tradition, a certain kind of tradition in a local church. Please never allow a tradition to become a fence between you and us and the others. Four, is there a fence in this church, in this church family here, between those that like percussion in worship service and those that do not like percussion in worship service. It, this hurt, right? It hurts me too. Because a few years ago, I decided I would read the Bible and accept the Bible as it is. And one of the big questions as somebody that was trained in certain areas of music was to go to the Bible and ask Lord, do you have any kind of problem with any of the instruments, music instruments people play? And you know what I found? The Lord doesn't 
have a problem with instruments. And you may be surprised that some of the instruments that are demonized in some groups, he says, yeah, take them and praise the Lord with them. So can we go back to the Bible? And I'm not saying we should swallow all kind of music nonsense. No, that's not about that. It's about sticking with the Torah, not with the fence of the Torah. I think that was number five. Number six, are you still counting? But I have a long list. <laughs> number six, is there a fence between those that wear jewelry and those that do not wear jewelry? And this is a sticky kind of question, right? Uh, spiky, uh, challenging question. You know why? Because based on the same Bible verses, some will come to the conclusion, no jewelry. Some will come to the conclusion, jewelry is all right as long as it's not the focus. But this is my question. If the Bible leaves it like this, can you leave it like that? Not for yourself. You do whatever you want for your own life. The point is not to build a fence between your group and the other group. Seven. And I'm going to st stop then. Is there a fence between those that eat out on a Sabbath and those that do not eat out on a Sabbath. Well, I know this is very challenging because there are two questions in play. First, are you allowed to eat food prepared on Sabbath by somebody else? And the second question is, is it all right to pay for your food on a Sabbath day? Is that tantamount to trading or working on a Sabbath? And I know now your question is, Pastor, what do you think? What do I think? Go to the Bible. I want to think the exact same way the Bible thinks. What I'm trying to tell you, though, is it's not fair to build fences based on interpretation that may be strongly challenged by some other interpretations. You don't believe what I'm saying. Let me give one bonus, because now we pass seven. Is there a wall between thoughts that are born in your mind, between your two ears, and thoughts that are born outside of this space that is born, that, that is between your ears? Because that's the question in the end. Yes, this is fundamental. And Paul goes on, look, he says, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What is that? Is this? That's the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together, that's the cornerstone, the one that keeps the whole building together, the foundational and structural stone, in whom the whole building grows, 
grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Can we grow together instead of putting up fences, walls of separation? Look what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Place of God, dwelling place of God in the Spirit. He wants to dwell. He wants to dwell in us. Not just create any kind, because he did some demolition. And now, he doesn't take the bricks from the demo. He takes us and uses us as bricks to build, to construct something new in which he wants to dwell. Amen? Amen.